Hello, you're listening to another episode of The So-Called Prophet from Pittsburgh. I am your host, Joseph L. Flatley. And uh, this episode, we are going to speak with a gentleman named Bryce. That's his uh, civilian name. In the community, he was known as Azalin. Bryce is a very interesting character. He's 23 years old. He uh, lives in Wisconsin in a uh, group home. He's a bipolar one. He's got it under control, it sounds like. But for, you know, a good bulk of his childhood, from 10 to age 21, he was living in the GCCA. His mother found the community by accident. She had taken a trip to Arizona and was staying in one of the community's vacation rentals that they operate and ended up kind of falling under their spell. And against the wishes of her family, ended up moving into the community with with Azalyn, with Bryce, as he was known at the time. I loved talking to Bryce. He was very forthcoming and about his life and about the community. And he goes into some detail about kind of his crazy journey that took him from Arizona back to Wisconsin. And uh, without further ado, here's Bryce. At some point while she's on her vacation, uh, the the cult got their hooks into her. Yeah, exactly. Okay. And then, you know, the cult has this whole thing about, you know, counseling and therapy and changing people's lives and then when somebody actually like you know bipolar one is like you know not really that bad it it is a disability but it's mm -hmm. nothing like you know it's something that you go to a doctor and you deal with it and you know you live a life your life just like any other condition but I guess the irony of this group you know having their head counselor and perp and all these alleged great ways to heal people, and then when they have yeah, somebody... With a- if I was going to go back there, I would be on the PRP program mm-hmm. immediately. <laughs> but, you know, can you, can you see what I'm saying, though? It's like you yeah. actually have a diagnosis, and you would think if they were, like, a loving community, they would just get you the help Except you needed. That. Yeah. Instead of just kicking Instead you just, to the curb. Yeah, exactly. Mm. All right, so walk me... um. Through your story, you you get there when you're 10 years old. Yeah. And, um... So I grew up there. Mm-hmm. I was, like, the the lead... I was, like, the lead, um... Manager for, like, the co-op. Okay. How there, old were like, you at that time? House. I was about 18. I was given a lot of responsibility at a very early age. hmm And so I just kind of just worked, like, regular hours from 8 to 5 every day at the co-op. Then I was a part of the food forest. I was a lead for that for many years. I have a lot of experience like in land landscaping, you know. Mm-hmm. Why not? Bikes, auto shop, welding, kind of like the regular stuff. Then I was on the construction crew for about four years doing um, on my electrician work uh, for um, and Elick, who was like the lead uh, electrician there, mm-hmm. who was my supervisor for a number of years, and I helped build the uh, the uh, Trinity domes. Um, I was affiliated uh, with Josh Josh Lilly. I was under under his uh, jurisdiction for for like for about that year because he was the main 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 contractor there who uh who led the uh construction team for a number of years Mm -hmm. could you tell me about the food forest yeah the food forest is a permaculture idea um it's a mixture of fruits nuts and trees um it basically after five years you like you don't have to have to do anything to it you know it's a, it's a self a sustaining thing mm-hmm. but i was uh but i was kind of like 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 the forester of it you know like i would prune it i would mulch it i would uh water it was pretty much was my thing for a while 
I mean, that's a pretty cool idea. So basically, like a forest, it's something that can just exist in the in a wild state without like constant like it's not like a garden that has to be planted each year and nah it's like trees you know mm-hmm. and um like how big is the food forest eh, it's about three acres okay and big. were they getting uh a lot of were they getting a lot of food off of it or was it just had it just started well seemingly that they don't have have a lot of like help anymore mm-hmm since, like, a lot of people have left, like, it's pretty, well, it's a lot of work to to have a food forest, you know. You got to, like, prune it, and then you have to call it for all the fruit, you know. Like, the fruit was very small, you mm-hmm. know, very small plums and stuff like that, you know, a lot of mulberries. Right. Yeah, you're not, like, you're not living off of mulberries, I guess. No, <laughs> Um, when I was there, Lenny, the, uh, the, uh, community supply house would get in, like, $7,000 worth of, uh, of organic produce every week, or every other week. We got, we got it down into, like, a science of having, uh, every two weeks, we would get a, um, a like seven pallets full of of organic uh, produce of chicken meats and vegetables and beans, you know. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> so that's how the community is feeding itself. Yeah, but pretty much leeching off the hospice for everything. Right, right. So the hospice is funding, like everything. Per- yeah, everything. Basically. Um, right. and um, so. So you get there when you're 10 years old, and what's it, like, what's it like being a child and coming to this community for the first time? Like, do you get thrown well, into they're school? Really, or? Like, they were very uh, convincing, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, like, see, like, like, there's children there, there's stuff like that, but they're not accredited school so like you if you wanted why to go back to college or something mm-hmm. you would have to raise money to do that or or the community i would raise it for you if you wanted uh, to do that you know it wasn't like all like because like let's take uh for example like uh i know Aminilik, he got his water license there sanskrit got her Six month uh, massage license there, you know. Mm-hmm. It was pretty flexible depending on on what you wanted, on what they wanted you, you as a as a uh, as a personal individual for them to use and to get money off of. Right. So they had a plan for everybody as far as yeah, that. they had a plan for everybody. And so you, as a ten year old, um, yeah. You you start going to school with the other kids. Yeah, I started going to school with uh, Eleonora. Mm-hmm. Um, we're pretty close in age. Uh, Shiloh, I know her from school. I know Skylar, Adam Zane. Adam Zane is there still mm-hmm. to like this day. Um, very smart, intelligent young man. Uh, and um, uh, so. You start learning about Gabriel, right? You start. Yeah, started the whole uh, learning about what this man is, you know. And like, how did that strike At you? At first, I wasn't really convinced. Yeah. Be like, be like, I wouldn't bow out to him for many years. I just didn't get that for like the first year when I first. Like I used, to, I I used to play with uh with uh, my, uh, my my Eleonora over at her mansion's house, mm-hmm. <laughs> Mandate Three, which I don't know if you know that that giant house Did that you, they lived in. What was it called? Uh, Mandate Headquarters Three. Okay, yeah, I, I've never heard it referred to. To as yeah, that. they're yeah, like they lived in three houses when they were. Affiliated with uh, with uh, Sedona, Arizona. 
All right, so you're 10 and you're you kind of f- start fitting in. You're you're taking these classes, you're going to school, you're playing with the kids. Um are you separated from your mom at this time or at any time? Well, first off, I wasn't separated with her until I moved uh, down to uh, this like the like the property, like right. the ranch, which they're now affiliated with. Uh, so you mean to McCockery? Yeah, to McCockery. Yeah, so you exactly. moved down there. How old were you? I was like 11. See, I, I was only there in Sedona for like uh, for about like a year. I moved down there. So when you moved to... Um, wh- what was it like when you moved to, um, to McCockery? Like what were you thinking? Was it... Were you excited or scared? or? Uh, it was like the Wild West out there. <laughs> okay, describe that for me, if you could. It was a big transition, having like uh, 135 people like moved down to like this this new property. It took us about uh, two years uh, to get everything ready, and everybody packed up and moved down there. Are you going to school at this time, or are you working? I was mostly doing manual labor throughout the day. I was working my ass off in the garden most most of the time. How many other of the kids are there doing manual labor? Like now? No, when you move, like when when you were during this moving time. I'm wondering, like, oh, it was me and uh, there was like three of us. The girls had had more privileges. They. Uh, well, the girls were up uh, up in uh, in Sedona, like doing school, you know. Still, but it was very separated. I mean, and then we had a uh, Dali Ban. I don't know if you know her, Gabriel's daughter. Like she taught us when she was nineteen. Down there, like reading and math and doing like a creative writing and stuff for like for about like half half of the day. And then they called it a mentorship, which was basically doing uh, manual labor out in the garden for hours on end. And are you li- you're not living with your mom at this point? No, I was living with uh, I was came on in a house, kind of like that orange house mm-hmm. over down by the lower side of the pond. Okay. And where was your mom living? She was up in in Sedona. Okay, so you were shipped just 11 years old. You're shipped down to work in the garden half a day, and well, it started out as a vacation for like the school, and it kind of just transformed into a six month uh, period, and then it just became years. <laughs> yeah, years of just being there. So you never left. Well, yeah, I, I got kind of like booted out of the commune Uh uh-huh did you ever have a transmission yeah i got two two transmissions all right could you explain what each of those was about yeah each of those was was about um maybe on a separate call i could get like a i could get like a photocopy of it from my mother and yeah we could read them sometime or something yeah that would be great um but just just um Roughly, like what? What did what he? Was it stated? Oh, yeah, like uh, yeah, like what? He gave you a name, and then he told you about your past lives. Yeah, Can you tell me what he told it you? Was Bryce is from Bryce Aslin is from is from like a line of leaders, a long a long line of leaders in past lives, uh, reincarnations on Fanavane, um, or repersonalizations on Fanavane. And that I was um, a star seed, and that my cosmic parents were there in the community, but they couldn't be uh, revealed at this time. Um, that's pretty much what it stated in the first transmission. Then the second transmission said I was a star seed from Vanavane, a third order star seed from Vanavane. And I was too mother circuited in my other repersonalizations on Vanavane. Been to Avalon, 
never done before. I've been to several worlds on Fanavane. I I was a soul who pretty much stayed in their local universe. I didn't really travel that much. I would occasionally travel like to Avalon and, and Nebadon on on frequent times but but nothing uh nothing nothing like compared to like Gabriel's standpoint as being like a like a like like a Prince Malfax, like the fan of Ain and stuff like that. The whole thing was was me going into Gabriel's house was kinda like I need I need more information about this. You know, like there was a lot a lot that just didn't make any any damn sense, you know. All right, so up until this point, I was kind of trying to keep Bryce from just launching into this story. But um, here we go into the point where Bryce, a.k.a. Azalin, breaks into Gabriel's house intending to chip him. The chip game, you'll hopefully remember from previous episodes, is a system where members of the community are on a constant lookout trying to bust their uh, fellow community members behaving uh, incorrectly and then they give them a quote-unquote chip and then give a report to the cult leadership. Of course, this is a control mechanism and people understand that you're not supposed to chip Gabriel or his family, but... Aslan had in his head that that's exactly what he was going to do. Because that's pretty extreme to break into somebody's house, right? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, would you say you were having a a bipolar, you know, like a manic episode or something? Or Well, you're under the mind control there, the brainwashing. And so what I... Well, we were doing this thing called Second Sight, which was like a like a relaxed meditation, meditation, uh, relaxing thing. Um, so it was like supposed to like help out help out like your psychic circle attainment that the bright and morning star kind of like taught us one night. So I was doing that for like multiple. Um, months and then it just just got all a lot of whack and then I kind of go into Gabriel's house you know so could could you describe the second sight meditation kind of in some yeah, detail sure. yeah so basically what it is you you basically you blank out your mind and you try to envision yourself as, as something from the past the present or the future and uh, or just or just try to go up in psychic circle levels. Uh, see, like a lot of people thought I was like like on the first psychic circle for like a couple weeks, but they just but but they just didn't like realize it or something, you know. The first psychic circle is that what you said? Yeah, that's kind of what uh, what Gabriel and Neon are are on. Everyone else is like on the third or second normally, or or if you're on perp, you're mostly on the seventh. <laughs> right, right. So, um, who are you doing these? Who's teaching you and guiding you through these exercises? Um, a lot of the teachings, the personal, like like kind of like. Like the community transmissions were for our community members only, and and I was a community member. And the bright and morning star, Gabriel, kind of like gave this, gave this kind of like this new meditation practice. You know, uh, the bright and morning star was the was like the teacher, like he taught me it. Oh, right. So you learn these in a community transmission. Yeah. Okay, so so you had a community transmission and 
Bright and Morning Star, speaking through Gabriel, presented this exercise. Yeah, exactly. Okay, and I mean, was that a common occurrence? He would give us so many different techniques and so many different exercises that every time when, when like my he would he would like um come in, you know. So this one, this one was kind of more of the like advanced one. Was it then up to community members to practice on their own, or did you do? Yeah, it? I did do it on their own. Okay. Like before, like going up, like to like bed and stuff like that. Okay, so you were doing it for like what period of time were you practicing this second sight meditation? I was doing it for about six months before the incident happened. Like every night. Yeah, every night and stuff. You know. You said that some of the people in your in the community thought that you were on the first psychic circle. Like, how did that come up? Some people were kind of getting suspicious about me. <laughs> they all kind of recognize something new and like fervent about me, you know, kind of more like angelic, I guess you could say. Like they didn't actually tell me that. Like it was kind of like like impressions. No, you, you were know? getting that impression. Yeah, I was getting that impression from like a lot of different people that I was around. Uh, so, yeah. are you? Do you now think that you were or? No, I, I think I was just under undermined uh, control, you know? Like, ever since living there, Lenny, I haven't really uh, believed in the in the Urantia book that much, you know? I, I kind of believe, like, like, some aspects about it, you know? Like, the aspects, like, that make sense. But, but all I kind of say to people is, you know... What do your what is your experiences with like the lives and teachings of Jesus? You know, because like I believe in Jesus, you know, uh, but God, you know, I can't grasp that that like that thing. But like, but by like Jesus, I can, and it uh, and people like you find God, it's great, you know, but for some people, it's it's just too. It kind of doesn't really make any sense. Being so abused with the idea of God in your life, as with the cult, it's really mind-blowing when you figure out the truth about Gabriel and what he has done. How old are you when you're doing these second sight meditations? And I was about 19. Okay. Yeah, it was like a a period over like a couple of years. Okay, too, you know? but it really kind of built up. To it really it. flourished like yeah. in that three month period when I okay went into that. Like, how's that feel? It made me feel like really good about myself, but like at the same time, you know, I kind of like I doubted Tony. You know, like see, like they didn't know what what to think when I went in there. You know, and chipped. I don't know if I told you if people have told told you like the full story like I go in there and chip chip uh, T and A chip uh, like um, uh, Eleanor like I I wanted to chip Gabriel but I I only got only so close to like the door and I and I, th- I threw like like a chip in, in, in into like the room you know probably lid it kind of like, uh, like uh, underneath underneath like the bed and be like happy birthday <laughs> what's going through your mind the night that you decide that you need to chip the people in Gabriel's household uh, well they were pretty freaked out when I went in there <laughs> yeah but what was going through your mind what what Why'd you make that decision? Well, I kind of wanted more like information about me. You know, I wanted like to become like a like a like a liaison minister. You know, you know. You felt you were like psychologically ready, or I mean, spiritually. Yeah, like I felt I was like so ready for it. You know. Describe exactly what happened. It's Saturday. Like what time? Saturday. Okay, it's Saturday, eleven o'clock. 
I go into Gabriel's house. How do you go in? How do you get into his house? I break a window. Okay, which window? Like the kind of like the drawing room window. Okay, and it's like a first floor window, and yeah, first floor window. And and you just bust it, and how'd you break it? Ah, crowbar. Okay, and you just smashed the window with a crowbar. Yeah, I just smashed it with a crowbar. Yeah, I kind of knew what the consequences were. You know, Mm -hmm. I mean, doing that like for vandalism and stuff like that, but. Mm -hmm. But I was willing, why, why to take, like, the chance with it and stuff, you know. So you went into the house. Are people awake? Are they asleep? Like, where? Oh, uh, like, they're asleep. Uh-huh. Do you guys tend to probably early to bed and early to rise at the community, right? Yeah, like, some are, some are, you know. Yeah. So, so first Van Dog comes out, barking. <laughs> Van and, Dog. And then, and then uh, Eleanor sees me, she kind of, like, screams and then Mata Lucian comes out about to like like punch 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 me in the head and then he And Mana Lucian is Danny, right? Yeah, Danny, yeah. And he uh realizes that it's me. He's like, What the heck? <laughs> Aslan, what are you doing over here? <laughs> and then and then uh and then Gabriel's wife, uh Tiende, um, comes out. And uh and she's like, sit down and call Arlen. And then Arlen comes speeding over here, which is like the like the police officer of Avalon Gardens. <laughs> he gets Lyotin to sleep with me across the across the hall. In your house where you live. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So I mean. It's everybody sounds like they're pretty calm for somebody breaking a window and crawling in through the window. Like, like, is this the whole story? You broke the window with a uh, with a crowbar. crowbar. You let yourself yeah, in, crowbar. and then Eleonora and Danny came out. TND came yeah, out. Yeah, they didn't really know. Like, they realized it was me. You know, I wasn't like a you like stranger or anything. Yeah, and then, I mean, what did they say? I mean, that's a pretty violent thing to do, to break into somebody's house, even if you didn't physically attack somebody. Yeah. You said you started chipping people? Yeah. Like, so you went to Gabriel's room and threw a a chip in there, right? Yeah. Like, what's going on while you're walking through the house with a crowbar? Well, I wasn't like like I dropped the crowbar outside the outside of the window, and I had chips in my in my pocket. Mm-hmm. And I chipped those guys. You know. So so you're like so you just handed them chips and said I yeah. <laughs> and and when you chip someone, you got to tell them why you're chipping them. Yeah, what did you I say? Why all of this stuff? It's it gets yeah. Like what did you say to them? Like what did you say to I Illinois? I said to TND, I was all like. I'm chipping you for like for men, like for like have, having this up place of compassion, like like for men, like like who work hard and stuff like that, you know. To, like like my Eleanor, I was like, I'm chipping you for like uh, for like like for not being like your true self, like in God and stuff like that. And then I chipped Arlen over in the car and like like for denying like. Like Christ, um, uh, in in the David's Zebedee life, you know, as him being David Zebedee. And, and and why did you um, chip Gabriel? Why did I chip Gabriel for giving me false false um, information about my soul? What what was that false information? Like, kind of like. Not, not like totally, totally being honest about about like what I was. Yeah. And what were you? I didn't really know. You just felt he was le- not giving you the complete picture. Yeah, well, I just wasn't giving me. See, like my whole life, there's always been, like, there's always been, been like this secret about me, there, that I wasn't allowed uh, to know. You see. You just always felt and this. I always felt this thing. 
like mm-hmm. that, like like that, like that. I kind of have, I have, I have like all of the all of the, like my eldership knows knows this knows 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 all like this one main fact about me, and no one else does. So what was I have to know now? What was the service the next day like? <laughs> he was all like, "Why the hell, the crap? The hell are you? <laughs> could it be? Could it be like another audio fusion of material con- con- compliment on the planet?" So it, it was kind of like, "I don't know." <laughs> so like, like, I would assume that if I were the leader like, of a group and somebody broke into my house, yeah. I would be like, would, this person's crazy, Papa. or they need to be punished. At the, or, at the insane asylum or something. Right. <laughs> but he took you you seriously on some level. Yeah, he did. That's so like, interesting to me. Yeah, like he... We sat there for five hours talking about me. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and, like, what were some of the things... That were discussed. You said he... okay. So basically, like, well, we like he didn't want to like say like about about like about of, of what happened like last night and stuff. And so he was kind of vague, and he was like, uh, "Could he be like a son of mine?" And I didn't say anything, of course. Um, uh, could he be a son of Nod? <laughs> or could he be a brother of mine? So Gabriel's teaching, and he, and, and the focus is on you for this whole service. Five hour conversation. When I left there and the cops come and stuff, um, I offered uh, to go out uh, to jail, actually. I offered. Let's not yeah. let's not skip ahead. Um, yeah, okay. Because you're in the service, and you know Gabriel's family just went through this traumatic event, and they're trying to kind of figure out what are we going to do about Bryce? What are we going to do about A- Aislinn? Is that how you say it? Uh, Aslin. Aslin. What are we going to do about Aslin? And um, yeah. But you realize that. Gabriel's a false prophet or not getting rep- true revelations. Is that correct? Yeah. During the service? And why, yeah. what about the service made you believe that? Well, kind of like he didn't really know like what to think. You know, he's, I kind of just I'm just trying to understand like so what? you're on a tra- whole a trajectory at this point where you're realizing that you, or you're coming to believe that you have like a spiritual level, like a higher spiritual level than a lot of people. Yeah. Um, then maybe even Gabriel. Yeah. And then, what about it? What about this service made you realize that that Gabriel was a fraud? Well, he didn't really, like, describe, like, I don't know, he didn't really know what to think of himself. (laughs) Like, his teachings just were obviously, like... Not really that good anymore. Like, I I would say, made up bullshit. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, Yeah, so so you were just left with that feeling that he was a uh, false prophet. Uh, and then, I'm sorry to, um, yeah, to keep coming up to that, but I just was just trying to like, you know, if I'm going to use this yeah. in a podcast, I need to have, like yeah, a, you gotta have to have more of a direct. Yeah. Thing. Right. Right. And, you know, and, yeah. and a, you know, an understanding of it, obviously. Um, yeah. So that incident happened. You were 19 years old. Well, which incident? Uh, the the, the f- first in the first time you broke into his house, or when you broke into his house? I broke into his house when I was twenty one. Oh, when you were twenty one. Okay. Yeah, twenty one. And um, 
And then there was another incident that got you kicked out? Well, no, that was that was the part of the incident. That was the only incident that got me kicked out of the sanctuary. All right, so what happens after the service? So after the service, they tell me that basically they're, they're calling the cops on me. And then the cops show up. And then they're all like, well, <laughs> like they come towards me and they're like, so like, so like, what did you do? Um, like he breaks the window and stuff. They tell him the whole story of what happened. And it's like the sheriff was all like, who really cares? It's a fucking window. Like, I, I, I've seen worse, worse things happen, happen like to people, kind of like murder and other stuff like that. And so, so like there wasn't any charge being, being pressed, 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 pressed against me. They were going to press some charges, but I, I was ready, like, to go, like, to jail, you know. Like, I told, like, the sheriff humbly, you know, oh, yeah, man, uh, I'll go to jail. <laughs> and, uh, and the sheriff was all like, I can't, I can't just take you into jail without having, 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 like, kind of like any, any real reason to take you to jail. <laughs> I mean, I guess anybody breaks a window, they're just gonna like write him a ticket. Yeah, basically, it's just vandalism. And then the next day in court, you know, it'd be like, if I really got something, you know, it'd be like, like three days in jail with like a with like a five hundred dollar fine or something like that. Right. So they called the police, the sheriff. Yeah, the sheriff. And the sheriff came, and they're like, "We're not gonna bring." And and basically, the cult was like you should arrest this man and then they were like well yeah. no that's not necessary yeah exactly. so when they didn't arrest you what did the cult do then so i was just sitting reading a book waiting white to hear hear like some like a, a decision basically i was just reading a book outside outside of, of my house and then arlen arlen um, comes over to me it's like, so, so Bryce, Aslan, you have two main options. You can leave here. We can, we can give you a ride up to, up, up to Tucson and leave you and leave you at the library or something. And then it's all, and then it's all on you. We'll pipe from there. Or two, or two, um, go, go voluntarily over to the, uh, insane asylum. So that's where I went. Like for, uh, survival reasons. So they said, be homeless or... Go to an insane asylum. Yeah. What was do you, what was the name of that place? Uh, the Behavioral Health Hospital, Palo Verde Behavioral Health Hospital, Tucson, Arizona. Wow. So they took you there and um. Like they help help me get uh, checked in and and so forth. Like. I mean, it really just sounds to me like you were in their community for over 10 years and um yeah about 11 years and you grew up you know with like the kids and um and you you know whatever reason you just had a little you know little trouble like all of us do in our life at some point and instead of like helping you they just shipped you off to a mini <laughs> bin yeah a loody bin. <laughs> you know like i mean like that's they done shocking. that to Teowa. I don't know if you know Landau's son. They did that to him. Yeah, Just I know. He's so and... he's not in good shape. I would talk. Yeah. Try to. I. I don't even want to try to talk to him because I can tell that he's in. You know, he's dealing with a lot of stuff. He doesn't need some. Yeah, know, like with a microphone calling him. To... Yeah, and his dad is quite affiliated with that bunch down there still. Right. Know? I've actually been trying to talk to Landau, and he. Uh, <laughs> he's been, not. Uh, a, very agreeable but um actually oh, okay. he's been very friendly very nice he's just not gonna yeah he is really a, a genuine soul but mm -hmm. just has a lot of loyalties to that place still you know? sure his family's still in there right yeah the exactly. rest of his family yeah um so so that was it like as far as your you being part of the community like 
you had that one little problem and they shipped you off and you haven't been back. Nope. And, um, I mean, at this point, are you still believing? Well, they, they did offer me to come back, but I said no. When was that? That was about last year. Okay. And how did that offer, like, come to you? What was... Oh, Arlen basically picks up the phone and basically calls me and is like, oh, yeah, do you want to come back? I was like, no. All right? You're just not welcome here anymore. Yeah. And um, you're, um, at this point, is it, you said you had um, lost faith in Gabriel that during that service after the incident, but... Um, yeah, I totally kind of knew that it was hocus pocus. <laughs> so from that point on, you're like, this is a cult, this isn't real? Yeah, it took me a long time to accept that since, like, that's all I've known, you know, through my whole entire life. Right, right. And, um... And not and not really being around him anyways, you know? And, uh, what do you miss about it? Well, I miss Gabriel. Like, I still love him as a, as a brother, you know, in Christ, but... I do miss him you know cuz he was such he was such like a really good uh motivation speaker for me you know for many years and you um so you you still even have loyalty to him or just feelings even though you've been yeah i do see him as a brother you know but i don't support him on facebook i don't support him financially i don't do anything as or some of the people who who have lived there and, and, and still kind of like it, you know. And I, I imagine you don't have a relationship with your mom. Uh, I do talk to her since I apologized for what I did. No, I'm not like kind of like ex 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 uh, communicated like like some of some of the others, you know. Like, yeah. I mean, that's it sounds like a tough like a tough thing to go through to like be kicked out kicked out of your home and then you know not see your mom and uh how you how you holding up oh pretty good yeah mm -hmm. i mean you sound pretty good i mean so as part of living in a group home i imagine you have like regular conversations with counselors and stuff not really this is a different kind of a thing okay like I mean, do you have a therapist or something, though? Have you discussed, like, Gabriel had, and <laughs> your past? But, but he said it was so s s silly that there's nothing really wrong with you. You just had a bad day, I guess. <laughs> yeah, you mean as far as the incident? Yeah. I mean, what it sounds like to me is, like, and you, you know, you can tell me if you think I'm off base. Um, oh, no, I think... We're right on here. But, you know, like, what it sounds like to me is, like, you were doing these meditations and stuff, and you kind of, kind of got carried away with it, and... Yeah, I was kind of, like, on the leash, like, <laughs> yeah. kind of like a rabid... Little... Like, flipped out a little bit? Yeah, I flipped out a little bit, yeah. Yeah, yeah, and, um... But, you know, that's nothing that... A little time, and chilling out you know doesn't when i mean do you think your bipolar um played into that at all i don't really know it's just really hard to really understand at all but what like i only know you know like and then so now that you're out, um, what's your kind of yeah. plans for survival for go going forward? Well, I'm just well. I'm starting a new job here in a little while. It's a factory. It's for like mentally uh, disabled people. So, be working there, making making some money and save up for like my own apartment and stuff like that. You know. So you're just putting one foot ahead of the other. Yeah, just. Just doing one step at a time here. Yeah. Sure. It's all, it's all you can do. 